Hello, and welcome back to Fandom Sage Powers, where we discuss comic books, comic heroes, you know, a little of this, a little of that. We are still into our X of Swords review, and we are at part five of the review. And before I jump in, I just want to say, if you love comics and you like whatever you like to do, it doesn't even have to be comics. There is usually something for everybody. If the Krakoan era of X-Men has not been to your liking, it's not your taste, that's fine. If you have something valuable to input to the conversation regarding what dissatisfied you in this Krakoan arc, pointing out specifics, I'd love to hear that. If you haven't read it at all, or you're just basing your opinion off hearsay or off one or two concepts, I really don't have anything to offer you except advice that you find something that brings you joy elsewhere, because this is a space for people who are fans and enjoy the X-Men and past, present, and future. That being said, let's get into this story. As we open in Krakoa, Storm is pondering. She seems like she's in deep thought. She knows what she has to do, but for the first time, she is feeling her purpose and her heart are at war with one another. She thinks about the words of that prophecy Polaris spoke. Once goddess, once queen, one sword with which to split the sky in twain. Vibranium inlaid, a tempest contained. The wrath of the heavens comes wielding a legacy. And she has met here in these gardens by Kate Pride. Kate says you tend to surround yourself with green whenever you have a lot on your mind. And Storm is saying, what makes you think that I feel anything but determined? Kate mentions that they've known each other a pretty long time. She knows that little wrinkle she gets in between her perfect eyebrows when she's feeling troubled. And Kate says, tell me, talk to me. And she speaks about the sword. Kate says she thought it might be nonsense, but you know what it means. Storm says, yes, I do, but I don't know if I'm ready for what taking it will mean. She says she thinks it means an end or a heartache and a strife at the least. Kate wants her to explain or better yet, just take her with her. But Storm says, no, she has to face this alone. But she seems pretty glad and Kate has cheered her up a little bit. Kate says, I know, I know you have to face it alone. You'll do what you have to do. And she'll keep a lamp burning for her in the window so she can find her way home. We then get this fable or this tall tale or myth about Wakanda. They say it began with a blinding flash of light, with the sky splitting open and striking a sacred mountain. Inside, they would find a gift from the heavens, a metal so pure that to touch it in its raw form was to know the truth of the universe. The ancestors of those that would become Wakandan forged a weapon to speak with the boom of thunder. The first Wakandan king, the first protector, was a wise and just man. When their enemies came to wreck and ravage, he begged them to turn around. He warned them that he held in his hand a conduit to heaven and that they would not survive. They did not heed him. And so he showed them the power that split the heaven and their holy mountain, Skybreaker. When the wise king grew old, he passed the sword to his child. The weapon passed from chief to chief, from protector to protector. It held back those who would destroy the fledgling nation, gave them safety to learn and grow. Skybreaker, the voice of the heavens, its edge is sharper than any other blade forged by man and will never grow dull. The weapon bore more fruit than protection. Studying the metal gave the Wakandan people an advantage. It helped them develop their natural and medical sciences. The conduit helped them unlock a deeper understanding of the world and develop technology at a blistering pace. It helped catapult Wakanda into the future. And we are in Wakanda in the throne room and we see Queen Ramonda, Princess Shuri, and she's speaking with one of her vassals. 
Adora Milaje interrupts and whispers to her, my queen, we have a petitioner. And Ramonda says, now? The Dora Milaje says, I believe you will make an exception for her. Aurora is led into the throne room and she's warmly greeted by Queen Ramonda and Princess Shuri. They say it is good to see her. She asks, where is the king? Where is T'Challa? Queen Ramonda says once again, my son's duties take him away from Wakanda, though he is due to return any day now. You know I can take your audience when he is away and I will happily hear you. Of course, Queen Mother, Aurora says, it was not my intention to be rude to you or any of the royal family. Shuri says, and there was no offense taken. Going on to ask, what brings you to Wakanda? Are you here as a sister or as a diplomat for Krakoa? Storms tells them both and more. Krakoa is in danger, and I came to plead for Wakanda's aid, but not just for our sake. If Krakoa falls, then the world falls. Ramonda says those are very strong words and not to dance around. What is it that is the conflict? What is the danger? And Shuri asks, and how can Wakanda stand with you? Storm says an army led by the original four horsemen of Apocalypse has breached Otherworld, the melting place of all realities, and threatens to come through to ours. The army of Arako covets what we have and wishes to destroy everything that is not twisted and cruel like themselves. Their march was halted by the only being powerful enough to force their impasse. But she is no more kind or just than they. She has made a game of things. The terms of the game are a contest of champions, ten of theirs and ten of ours. I have been chosen to stand for Krakoa, and I am in need of my sword, and that is why I have come to you. Wakanda has a vital role to play in this. We will have our warriors ready within the hour an army to join your Kakoan forces, Ramonda says. I will outfit them with the best weapons and join you. Storm says your generosity is humbling, but unfortunately that can't happen. The rules of the challenge are bound in Otherworld magic. Only the designated champions may enter Otherworld and fight, and then only with their specific swords. Sherry again says, then I will make you a sword to whatever specifications you need. Ramonda says, no, daughter, this contest calls for a weapon with history. She will have her choice in the best we have to offer. Okoye, bring me the arms of Wakanda, the nation maker, the blade that belonged to the founder of Wakanda's capital city. It has struck down over a thousand enemies. The panther's claws, traditional blades of black panther. They are sharp now as the day they first cut the air. The King's Mercy, the sword of my husband, T'Chaka. No sword in the world is stronger or more finely crafted. It adapts to the wielder's strength and increases the speed of attacks. And Storm is listening while Ramonda's kind of running down all the arms and the goods they have. And she says, my heart is overwhelmed with gratitude, yet still I can't accept these. The Queen is right. The blade is one with history, tied to the heart of Wakanda. It is the Skybreaker. And this really shocks them that she wants to use Skybreaker. Ramonda says, you know, that is not possible. Shuri says that would be a disaster. The people would riot. You know, only the king may lay hands on the Skybreaker and he is not here. Queen Mother, Aurora starts. Please, no, I would not ask if the fate of Krakoa of the world weren't at stake, but there is not time to wait. If I don't appear at the meeting place with the sword soon, we have already lost. Now, this situation is already quite complicated on a political sense, and you can get the sense that Ramonda and Shuri have a lot of affection for Storm. She was married to T'Challa, so she was a daughter and a sister to both of them. But this is a little bit too much because this is a sacred and treasured artifact to their people. Ramona says, you ask much of us, and if it were up to me, I would grant you your request. The fate of your people and the world are worth the risk of the people's anger, but I cannot. My son will return in the next few days, and you can ask him for what you need. Until then, you will stay, of course, as a honored guest. Storm was very disappointed, a little defeated, but she says, you know, she has decorum. She says, okay, of course, Queen Ramonda, I'm grateful for both your wisdom and your kindness. While Shuri has a suspicious look on her face.
later in her room storm is rustling about and she has a little knock on the door and she says come in it's shuri she comes in she brought her some food she knows she has been up here and hasn't had dinner yet so she thought to herself shuri you cannot let aurora brood alone on an empty stomach she says i hope that you will allow me to intrude on your evening for a little while and Storm says, this is your home and I am a guest, so I would be honored to share a meal with you. Shuri unveils the food she brought and says, it's a, that's a bit formal for someone whose brother you called husband. And I would like to think that we share love for each other. Why not tell me what's on your mind? She says, I know you're frustrated that you will have to wait for T'Challa's return, but surely you can understand the position you put my mother in. Storm says it wasn't my intention to make anyone's life difficult, but if T'Challa doesn't return soon, the consequences will be regrettable. Shuri says what you ask for could lead to discord among the people. There are those who already think little of brother and our family and might use this as an excuse to incite revolt. This could cost lives. Aurora tells her, even before I was queen, I always believed in taking care of the needs of the people above my own. If it were up to me, I would not put Wakanda in such a position. I don't want to cause any strife, but what waits on the other side of those gates in other world does not care about good intentions or political alliances. The enemy will overwhelm and consume everything. At best, we and everyone we love will be at their mercy. At worst, we will be annihilated. What proceeds after this is a very polite, bet tense political exchange between Shuri and Storm. Shuri says some would say the same thing about your Krakoa, taking what you want, resting control of the economic markets, flooding the world with your cure-all flowers. And now you ask for something that could be used to destabilize Wakanda. This contest of champions comes at a very interesting time. Storm says we found yours that will take humanity decades, perhaps centuries to find. Our flowers have saved thousands of lives already. We happily shared, asking only to be accepted as a people in return. Do you really believe that this is a ploy by Krakoa to hurt Wakanda? Do you think so little of mutants? Of me? Of course not, Shuri says. Aurora Wakanda may not have signed a treaty with Krakoa, but we freely welcome mutants here and have never discriminated against them. And whatever differences we have had, pushing past them has only made us closer. I believe you, as does my mother. But you have to see this from our perspective. Even the most future-minded of us honor our ancestors, our history. There are those here who would see this as an act of war by Krakoa, even if my mother herself reassured them it was not. They would use this as an excuse to cause dissent among the people. This could lead to Wakandan blood running in the streets. The other side is also of concern to me, Storm says. I've been tasked with fighting for and possibly dying for the safety of and continued existence of Earth, on which both Wakanda and Krakoa sit. All the more reason to wait for T'Challa, Shuri says. He would want to have the chance to help in every way he can. My brother, the two of you are finally back to a place of mutual respect and affection. Don't let impatience damage all the work you've put into repairing your relationship. At this point, Shuri may have felt a slight chill in the air because Aurora says your brother has ignored my calls for his help because they are not convenient for him to answer right now. But Krakoa goes to war for you as much as it is for itself. Before I was Storm of the X-Men, I was protector of the planes. They called me goddess. I know sacrifice and I know suffering. I know the weight of the people's need and dependence on my power and choice. I know who I am. I know what I must do. I don't mean to imply that the danger Krakoa is in is less worthy than Wakanda. I only ask, Storm cuts her off and says, I won't ask anything further of Wakanda. Now, please, I don't mean to be rude, but it is late and I would like to rest. It has been a long and stressful few days. Storm tells Shuri that they can continue the debate in the morning when the sun is shining and save her a seat next to her for breakfast. Before Shuri leaves, she tells Aurora, for a time you were called Aurora Akadi T'Challa and we were sisters. It is out of that sisterly love that I ask you, please, remember that I have a duty to my people that supersedes all others. Storm tells her, and in that spirit of that same love, please understand that so do I. After Shuri departs, Storm is already determined. You see that she is already moving to get in action. She says she did tell Shuri the truth that she knows who she was and she knows what she must do. And you see her pulling out 
her black stealth suit and she flies off into the night. The Temple of the Heart of Wakanda. This is a flashback we see of when Storm was queen next to her king T'Challa in Wakanda. T'Challa told Storm that after their weapons moved beyond the sword, it became a symbol of the spirit of Wakanda. It is sacred and is to never be taken from Wakandan soil. Flashing back to the presence, we see that same temple and once again the story has beginning with light. Storm takes out these drones that are patrolling the outside of this temple. Instead of revelation, this time there is darkness. Storm overloads the facility with energy, causing it to shut down to prevent permanent damage. Its power is on a separate grid from the system that sends energy into the city. She notes that there will be more analog obstacles inside, but the cameras and most technology-based security are down for now. She probably has about half an hour before things come back online. In the past, T'Challa told her, if you were to be my queen, you must know our truths. This facility is under 24 hour surveillance by the priests. The drones patrol the exterior to feed their information to the priests who in turn report daily to an offsite facility. There are priests at every intersection in every corridor. In the present, Storm knows she does not have time to find a way around these priests, so she has to go through them. The temple suddenly goes dark and the priests look panicked. Storm has to remind herself, even as she hurts these innocent people, she's doing it so she can save lives, and this is for the greater good. She repeats this in herself like a mantra. She regrets that she has given them another reason to fear the dark. As one of the priests attacks Aurora, she slides as he says that she will not succeed here, traitor. She says more ruthless men than you have failed to stop me my entire life, good priest. The priest tells Aurora that she shames herself and she tells him only if it is shameful to fight for what is right. And you may never know what was at stake here. In the past, T'Challa has brought Storm to Skybreaker. He says these lasers are invisible, but no less deadly. They slice through anything short of vibranium, enough to dissuade even the most clever of thieves, eh? Storm ponders. A part of me wonders if T'Challa knew that I might need to infiltrate this place someday, that he might want me to succeed in bypassing these measures if the need was great enough. In the present, Storm summons an arctic wind. The lasers were not constructed to withstand such bitter cold. And they are the last step between me and my goal, Storm thinks. And they all fail. She also says there's a good chance that that failure will trigger a secondary alarm, but she has no choice. The lack of screeching sirens and metal doors slamming is a hopeful sign. She reaches for Skybreaker in awe of the blade. She says, even after all I have seen, I must admit that what is achieved here is truly a wonder of nature and man. It is sacrilegious to interfere, to touch, but I must, or else even the mighty Wakanda will fall. At this point, the computer system and the security will reboot in 18 minutes. Suddenly, there is a blast of energy knocking the blade from Aurora's hand. We see Shuri has entered the temple. She says, I hoped that my intuition would be wrong and that I would not find you here. Storm descends from the altar. Stand aside, Princess Shuri. Shuri says, you know that I can't. If you take Skybreaker, you will cause strife among the people. Brother will fight brother, all because you could not wait. Storm says, there is no time, Shuri. You could hide the fact that it's gone. Shuri says, there is no hiding what you have done. You would leave us bleeding while you run off and possibly die fighting in some game? Frustrated, a Storm says, you are my sister, Shuri. And I, I am sorry it has come to this. But if you won't move, then I will move you. Shuri says, Aurora, please don't do this. We could go back to the palace. Come with me and I will pardon you. It's not too late. And Storm says to her, you still act as if what is happening is at your whim. So arrogant. I'm trying to save you. And you are worried about saving face. Shuri says, what I care about is saving my people from the damage you will cause them. She says, I tried to reason with you, Aurora, for both our people's sake. You leave me no choice. Using her vibranium gauntlets, Shuri takes aim at Storm and tries to blast her at close range. Storm says, all of this is a choice, yours and mine. 
You have chosen selfishly. Storm retaliates with a blast of cold arctic wind and she tells her, I will not allow your choice to damn us all. Shuri's gauntlets begin to malfunction, freezing over. She throws them away and says, you underestimate me, sister. She pulls out a vibranium dagger and tells her, you forget that I have worn the mantle as protector as often as inventor. Storm picks up the Skybreaker replica and says, I will ask you a final time, Shuri. Stand down. They square up and they clash blades. Help me save us all, Storm says. Shuri says, all you had to do was wait. And Storm says, all you had to do was trust me. She is fast. Her skill is undeniable, Storm thinks, as she's disarmed by Shuri. And this makes this all the more easy, she thinks. As Shuri holds up her blade to Storm, she says, you will come with me back to the palace, and together we will speak to Chichala. Storm says, I am so sorry, sister. As she touches the blade, she electrocutes Shuri and says, I love you too much to let you stop me. Storm goes to replace the Skybreaker with the replica and notes that Removing it from the dais will probably set off some sort of countermeasure. So she hopes that replacing it with this fake may buy her a few minutes to keep the system from locking down. She takes it and says, I can only hope that it worked. 30 minutes has passed and the system has rebooted. Breach detected. Lockdown protocols initiated. The doors began to slam shut and Storm thinks to herself, panic will serve no one. Having been married to the king has its advantages. Knowing his royal command codes, for example, unless, of course, that has been accounted for. She thinks to herself that she did not want to leave long lasting damage. She'd hope to bring back the sword and leave it safely in the temple afterwards. But there is no time for sentimentality now. She strikes the security access box with a lightning strike, and the doors open. From the darkness, there's a sound an animalistic but robotic sound, and out come these mechanized panther droids. They declare the Skybreaker protocol has been initiated. Storm thinks, my beloved ex-husband failed to inform me about this. As the androids descend upon her, Storm unleashes a thunderous clap of lightning and begins to slice through the droids. The Skybreaker is cutting through them like a hot knife through butter, absorbing Storm's electricity and lightning into itself. At last, Storm defeats all of the androids and catches her breath when a voice from behind her says, My mother said you came claiming to be in need of aid. T'Challa stands there with more priests, saying, And yet here we find you stealing from those who welcomed you. Storm says, There is no time for bureaucratic games, T'Challa. Not with what is at stake. The priests raise their spears to her, saying that she has Skybreaker, my king. T'Challa says, I can see that and at ease and he removes his mask saying why Aurora? you know i would do anything for you even this why betray me like this storm says this has nothing to do with you t'challa or with us i'm here so that i can save my people t'challa says your people i remember a time when wakandans were your people we could be again if you would just wait and listen storm says my life does not revolve around your whims even if my heart aches with missing you you will step aside because you know that anything else would be the end of us all. The priests begin to protest, but Tatalus tells them to stand down. To Storm, he says, I have never known you to be malicious or untruthful. If it is as you told my mother, then I cannot in good conscience stop you. We could have done this together, my love. I would do anything for you. Storm says, this is bigger than you or I, T'Challa, bigger than Wakanda or Kakoa. And I could not wait for you to decide that you had the time. T'Challa tells the soldiers to let her go and to destroy the gate. If the emissary of Kokoa wishes to return, it will not be as a thief in the night, but with the permission and grace of Wakanda, if we so choose. As Storm re-enters Kokoa through the gate, Kate is waiting there for her, asking, was it what you expected? Storm says it's worse, I think. We have lost no allies, but there will be a lot of work to get trust back. Kate tells her, you did what you needed to do. And she tells her, I have been a protector longer than I have been a wife. I know the sacrifices that must be made, and I know who I am. She strikes her blade into the sigil, and it lights up. Wolverine tells her, I never doubted you for a second, with magic saying, welcome to the party. That's three out of ten sword bearers and sigils activated. What an incredible story. The thing I love about Storm is her conviction. 
even though she is conflicted about what she has to do she knows what the right move is ultimately and she commits to it fully she tried it the diplomatic way the nice way and came to ask permission first and when it was not possible then she resulted to her other skill set thievery now a lot of people forget storm grew up on the streets of cairo she was a pickpocket and a thief and she was a very good thief so she knows her way around things and how to get in and out and again on a time crunch and in a place like Wakanda, where the technology is so, so advanced that she really had to kind of play things fast and loose. But she got it done in the end. She probably would have gotten away even if T'Challa had tried to stop her. She probably would have gotten out. It's hard to say, honestly, it, 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 there was a gate there, so she could have attacked. But obviously, these two people really still care a lot about each other. So that wasn't going to come to that. This whole exchange between shuri and storm felt really really authentic to me the way they spoke about each other being sisters the way they were trying to get their points across without being too disrespectful or too combative about it really felt authentic to me as you know having a sister having little spats about certain things that neither one of you all is wrong or right all the way but you have to stand on principle at times and you can't really budge on certain things. And we know as the reader what kind of stakes there are for a storm if she doesn't get this blade. But Shuri and Ramonda and T'Challa don't. They don't really know. They just have to take Storm's word for it. Ultimately, that was too much to ask. So Storm had to resort to taking it. And she did so with regret. She did it with contrition. She didn't want to have to do it that way. She's also not going to beat herself up about it because she knows what she's doing ultimately is the right thing. So what did you think about part five of X of Swords? Do you think Storm went about things the right way? you think there was a better way? I honestly don't. Even though if she had waited, T'Challa ended up being right there anyway. So it would have been the same amount of time, but she didn't know that. Tell me what you think, guys. Please like and share this video. And if you haven't already, go ahead and hit that subscribe button.